coming up on this Tuesday edition of Daybreak. After a bumpy confirmation process, lawmakers approve Iwan Gu as Korea's next prime minister. A small cabinet and presidential office shake-up is expected as early as today. Egypt's Air Force bombs Islamic State targets inside Libya, a day after a video shows the beheading of 21 Egyptians. First Denmark says the gunman who attacked a free speech debate and a synagogue in Copenhagen was not part of a wider cell. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Tuesday, February 17th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. Our top story this morning, after several months and a handful of nominees, Korea finally has a new prime minister. Lee Wang Gu was confirmed on Monday despite some intense political wrangling over whether he was suitable for the job. Prime Minister Lee's first task is a tall one, to win back the public's trust. Lee ji starts us off. Newly elected Prime Minister Lee Wan Gu now holds the country's second highest position. With him in place, President Park Geun-hye can focus on carrying out a cabinet reshuffle and move forward with her policies aimed at economic revitalization and helping the working people. However, the main opposition party and the public speculate that Lee may become a vegetative prime minister, as many see him as unqualified for the job. Since his confirmation hearing last week, he has been under intense fire for allegations of ethical lapses, including real estate speculation and draft dodging. Although he passed a parliamentary confirmation vote through overwhelming support from his ruling party members, he now bears some heavy responsibilities relating to state affairs. Prime Minister Yi will be tasked with reforming the pension system for civil servants, rooting out corruption among public officials, and restructuring the labor market. Once the presidential office carries out a small reshuffle based on his recommendations, he will have to show his strength to control and lead the cabinet. The new prime minister will also have to foster an atmosphere where the presidential office, the National Assembly and the government can better communicate with one another to coordinate policies. Prime Minister Yi has said he would do his part in maintaining cooperation between all governmental parties and, in particular, uphold relations with the main opposition in order to create bipartisanship to push forward with state affairs. Lee Jun, Arirang News. Lee Wang Gu's first full day as Prime Minister will have a strong focus on boosting public safety. First things first, though, uh, as he is scheduled to meet President Park geun -hye this morning to receive his official letter of appointment. He will then be inaugurated at 2 p.m. this afternoon. Yi's first schedule as Prime Minister will take him to the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters and the National Police Agency, where he will urge officials to enhance national safety and root out corruption. President Park Geun-hye is calling on her special unification committee to come up with ways to fund a smooth transition to a unified Korea. She says the eventual reunification of the two sides should not only benefit Korea, but the rest of the world as well. Chae Sun reports. President Park Geun-hye, who has said a unified Korea will offer a bonanza to the peninsula, says a unification roadmap should be drawn up to include benefits not only for the two Koreas, but the world. By attracting international attention to investment opportunities in a unified Korea, the president expects to offset anticipated unification costs. President Park's envisioned blueprint would include overseas funding for social overhead capital and resources development in the north. At the same time, the president urged Pyongyang to take note of countries like Mongolia, Vietnam and Myanmar, which have carried out reforms and opened up their markets to the outside world. 북한은 이런 변화의 물결을 외면하지 말고 직시해서 하루속히 개혁과 대화의 길로 나서야 할 것입니다. 
With regards to Pyongyang's nuclear ambitions, President Park said Seoul and the international community should continue to persuade the North to change its course and explain how unification would benefit both Koreas. Che Yusun, Arirang News. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says his government will draw up legislation on collective self-defense that will allow Japan to respond seamlessly to various emergency situations overseas. If the legislation is passed, Japan will be able to dispatch troops overseas in certain limited circumstances, giving an example of when Japan could exercise the right to this so-called collective self-defense. Abe talked about a hypothetical situation in which a U.S. warship carrying Japanese came under attack. Abe also emphasized the new realities of today's world and vowed that Japan would do more to bring peace and stability to the Asia-Pacific region and the world. Korea and Japan have no plans to renew their 14-year-old currency swap deal amid a breakdown in their bilateral relations. Korea's finance ministry announced on Monday that the last outstanding currency swap deal between Seoul and Tokyo worth 10 billion U.S. dollars will expire next Monday as scheduled, and they have made no further agreements for a future deal. This was widely expected, as diplomatic relations between the two countries have cooled significantly over Japan's territorial claims to Korea's Dokdo Island. In addition, Korea's need for the extra cushion provided by the deal has uh, decreased, as it has abundant foreign reserves backed by a strong current account surplus. Now, there's growing consensus that there's an unspoken global currency war taking place as major economies around the world uh, continue to loosen their monetary policies. In Korea, eyes are on whether or not the country's central bank will join this race to slash rates to stay competitive. Uh, Hwang Jie reports. So far this year, 17 countries and the European Central Bank have eased their monetary policies either by lowering their key interest rates or introducing quantitative easing programs. Canada, Switzerland and 11 emerging economies like India and China are in this race, which comes as the countries try to prop up their ailing domestic economies. Now pressure for further monetary easing by Korea's central bank is piling up. But analysts say it's unlikely the central bank will take action on Tuesday. This month's monetary policy meeting is taking place right before the Lunar New Year holiday, and the central bank has not signaled a rate cut. So we'll keep the rate unchanged for this month. Korea's finance minister Che kyung hwan also emphasized last week that it's more important to push through structural reforms than to debate over a rate cut. Still, analysts expect a rate cut to take place sometime in the second quarter this year. The Korean economy is not showing signs of momentum for a solid recovery so far this year, just like in the fourth quarter of last year. To give a much-needed boost to the economy, the central bank is expected to cut the rate in April or May before the U.S. Federal Reserve starts to raise its key interest rate. Korea's low inflation rate is also giving the central bank room to trim its key interest rate. Consumer prices were running below the BOK's 2.5 to 3.5 percent inflation target ban for more than two years in January. Some analysts say, however, that the central bank will not join the global move toward monetary easing, as there's no clear sign of it affecting the local financial market. Hwang Jie, Adang News. Korea's Incheon International Airport is celebrating a record 10th consecutive year as the best airport in the world for service. The Airports Council International gave Incheon a near-perfect score of 4.97 points out of 5. Uh, it also came top of the pile in other categories. It was named the top Asia-Pacific airport as well as the top big-sized airport. Now, Incheon International Airport was included in that category for the first time as it reached the 40 million passenger mark in 2013. 1,800 airports took part in this survey.
Time now for a look through the global headlines. We're following this uh, Tuesday morning from Seoul. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim, uh, standing by for us at the News Center. Good morning, Eunice. Good morning. Anger erupts in Egypt, Mark. One day after the Islamic State group released a video showing the beheading of 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians. That rage was unleashed over the skies of Libya, where the decapitations are said to have taken place. Cairo said its pre dawn airstrike struck IS camps, training sites, and weapon storage areas, and that they will continue. This as some of the victims' families held a funeral service for their loved ones in El Or village of Samalut, though their bodies presumably remain in Libya. Egypt's President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi called on the international community to expand its fight against IS beyond the strongholds of Iraq and Syria to include Libya, saying the situation there was also a threat to world peace and security. The U.S. Security Council and Secretary General Ban Ki-moon condemned the mass murder as heinous and cowardly as Pope Francis, in his Monday address, urged Catholics to remember these brothers who died for the mere fact of confessing Christ. And on to another country shrouded by sadness, Denmark. Thousands of people came together in a vigil in Copenhagen on Monday to mourn the victims of the weekend's twin attacks at a free speech gathering and outside a synagogue. Makeshift vigils were also held near Danish embassies around the world, including one in Berlin, where flowers were laid and candles lit in the colors of a country proud of its openness and safety record. Denmark's prime minister also said the country was facing a conflict with violent extremists and not Muslims and pledged to remain strong and not be intimidated by attacks to free speech and other liberties. Meanwhile, local media and Reuters have identified the 22-year-old late gunman as Omar El Hussein, a man with a history of committing crime and who does not appear to be a part of a wider terror cell, according to the prime minister. Clashes are escalating in eastern Ukraine, where a fresh but delicate ceasefire is struggling to stay in place. The Ukrainian military and pro-Russia separatists traded accusations that the other had violated the unconditional truce. Kiev said at least five of its soldiers were killed in the first day of the ceasefire, citing that it saw no less than 112 attacks, 88 of which were at the railway town of Dobaltseva, a strategic transport hub in the eastern Donetsk region. Pro-Russian rebels had said the terms of the truce did not apply to Dibaltseva, where thousands of government troops are said to be encircled by separatist fighters. Now, the rapid increase in the number of Chinese tourists to Korea has the nation's travel industry jumping for joy. This year promises to be the best year yet, especially uh, during the upcoming Lunar New Year holiday, which is forecast, in fact, to see a record number of Chinese coming to Korea. But there are serious concerns this trend might burn out pretty fast, especially if the quality of tourism services continues to leave some visitors feeling pretty cold. Our Guansua reports. It's that time of the year again, when a single country's visitors to Korea bring about happy smiles to the nation's economy. It's Chinese tourists who are flocking in again for this Lunar New Year's holiday season, the biggest in China, beginning on Wednesday. This year's number of visitors to Korea during the one-week period is expected to reach around 120,000, a 30 percent fall jump from last year. Visits are on a steady rise, with a total of 7.2 million Chinese expected to come over this year. It's welcoming news for the sluggish domestic economy, as shopping tops the to-do list for the average Chinese tourist. I bought a lot of cosmetics, shoes and clothes. Experts say this year looks especially promising. Chinese tourists are estimated to bring Korea around 180 million U.S. dollars from direct consumption just during the Chinese New Year holiday season, and that figure will probably top 630 million dollars for all of February. 
But not everyone is satisfied with everything they experience on their trip. I had no problems with communication or accommodations, but I did have problems trying to receive after service for something I bought here last year. A recent study shows that Chinese tourists complained the most about having troubles with communicating during their visit. Second and third on the list were unsatisfactory food and high costs. This is why experts say there needs to be a bigger focus on high-quality tourism rather than quantity so that the Chinese visitors do not call their trips to Korea a one-time experience. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And uh, as Soa alluded to in her report, the three-day-long Lunar New Year holiday begins on Wednesday, tomorrow. And most Koreans will be exchanging gifts with their family and friends, meaning that it's one of the busiest times of year for the nation's delivery workers. Our Shin Se-min reports. Tis the season. It's that time of year again when the postal service in Korea gets flooded with packages filled with items like fresh fruit, meat, health products and other popular seasonal gifts. They will be shipped to cities and towns across the country ahead of Lunar New Year's Day. Piles of packages. Over 500,000 parcels are being checked in and out of this distribution center every day, at least during this time of the year. The amount? Nearly double the usual, forcing the Postal Service to expand its manpower by 10 percent for the holiday rush. While there is definitely gratitude owed to the senders of these items, the backbreaking work of local postal and delivery service people should not be forgotten. Yeah, <laughs> 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 has been delivering some 300 boxes a day, trying to keep up with the rush of packages. His days have gotten longer, and his nights of rest much shorter. I don't really look forward to the holidays. I used to like them, but being in this profession has changed my perspective. Now, I personally hand deliver gifts to my relatives. Despite the drawbacks, Lee still gives 110 percent to his work. It's a little nerve-wracking. I have to be careful that I don't lose or mishandle any of the packages, especially because I know they're gift boxes. And thanks to Lee and others like him in the delivery service, hundreds of thousands of people across the country will be able to share and enjoy an even happier holiday this year. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Korea's southern port city of Busan has blossomed into one of the country's best culture and tourism hubs over the years. But some in the city are saying the shine is starting to come off. Our Jimmy Gill sat down with a lawmaker from the city to find out what Busan needs to do to keep pushing forward. Busan, probably known for its annual Film Festival and the G-Star Global Game Exhibition is striving to become a global city. What more does it need to do and what other investments need to be made in order to make it a competitive global city? I believe Busan can gain competitiveness on the global stage by expanding the convention industry and revitalizing the economy of the western part of Busan, which is lagging behind in development compared to the eastern part of the city. Busan wants to build a new airport and is currently bidding for the 2028 Summer Olympics, which is all part of the future vision for the city. All of these projects will require a significant investment. What do you think about the values of all the projects in relation to the size of the investment? Focusing on external development is important with the Olympics, as you mentioned. But I believe working toward internal stability is also important. Busan is facing problems such as elderly poverty and increasing suicide rates, both of which are far above the national average. There need to be policies that can help boost quality of life for the citizens of Busan. In fact, all these problems could apply to other cities in Korea, too. How do we move away from metropolitan development and toward balanced regional development? 
Busan is barely keeping its title as Korea's second largest metropolis after Seoul. Cities like Busan need to encourage balanced regional development to ensure national competitiveness. National policies should be oriented towards helping people who live in provincial cities to establish a firm footing in their hometowns. As a member of the Parliamentary Committee for Education, Culture, Sports and Tourism, what are you hoping to achieve this year? In order to keep Busan from slipping into decline, I think we need to make education the top priority. Many of Busan's young students are leaving to go to universities in Seoul because they feel a gap in educational opportunities. I think my duty is to narrow the gap with the capital region. Thank you, lawmaker, for speaking with us today. And a good Tuesday morning to you all as we kick things off with the Korean national football team where after confirming their March A match schedule, they've announced the venues for the two matches against Uzbekistan and New Zealand on Monday. And it seems like both matches will take place here in the nation as the March 27th match against Uzbekistan will take place at the Daejeon World Cup Stadium, marking it the first time in nearly 10 years that an A match takes place in the same venue Korea defeated Italy during the 2002 Korea-Japan World Cup. And on March 31st, the match against New Zealand will take place in Seoul at the Seoul World Cup Stadium as the KFA continues to spread the venues all around the nation. Now, when FINA, the world swimming governing body, gave uh, Park Tae-hwan an extension on the hearing, which was initially set for February 27th, uh, we were all saying finally he caught a break. Well, it seems like shortly after that, hit another bump on the road, this time possibly a career ender. According to reports coming out on Monday, Park tae hwans suspension initially began on September 3, 2014, when he first tested positive on a banned substance. But because he requested for a B-sample testing, his suspension might start on the date where he tested positive the second time, meaning December 8, 2014. And with this mandatory provisional suspension being pushed for three months, this means that a 20-month suspension, which he's likely to receive, will not allow him to participate in the 2016 Rio Summer Games and possibly end his career. Now, it seemed like everyone was blaming Lee Sang Hwa's left knee issues for the reason why she's been struggling this season in speed skating, except for her coach Eric Bauman, who's saying that it's not her knee. In an interview after Lee Sang Hwa's fifth place finish at the ISU Single Distance Speed Skating Championships, the national speed skating team head coach Eric Bauman stated that it's not her left knee that's the problem, but fatigue. He added that she's not been able to rest and that along with her knee not being 100% is the reason for why she has been struggling. Now, the former Dutch junior team head coach made it clear that a surgery is not needed, that she'll be soon back in form after a proper rest. Now it seems like number three has been quite a popular number in the sporting world recently, with Son Heung Min scoring three goals this past weekend, and both Lee Sang Hwa and Mo Tae Bum going after their third straight gold in the 500-meter event. But this time, it's in the LPGA. Now with the ISPS Honda Women's Australian Open taking place starting on Thursday, the Korean LPGA stars hope to make it three straight victories to start off the new season. After Chen Ayun and Kim Se Young grabbed the first two titles of the season. But historically, the odds are against them as Shin ji is the only past winner in the history of the event when she won it back in 2013. <laughs> and that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. Uh, most of the rain clouds moved away from the peninsula, but snow keeps falling for the eastern parts of the nation. So for those of you who plan to travel to eastern parts of the peninsula, beware of snowy and slippery roads. In the meantime, the other parts will see on and off morning drizzle, then mostly to partly sunny skies will be featured. But please note that yesterday's rain eased some of the dryness in the air, and the air got much cleaner. 
Now it looks to be chillier today. The temperature readings will be a few notches lower, and strong gusty winds will add a chill to the air, bring down the sensory temperatures. So dress warmly before heading out today, and let's take a closer look at the readings for today. So the daily low here in Seoul is kicking off at two. Then the daytime high will rise to five, while Taewoo and Gwangju peak at nine and six, and Busan will top out at eleven this afternoon. And as for the other regions, Jeju Island and Daejeon should see a high of nine and five, and Tokyo also sees a high of five later this afternoon. Well, that's all for the weather at this hour, and hope you have a wonderful start to the day. Well, thank you very much, Jion, for the weather update there. And that is going to do it for us for now. Korea Today is coming up at the top of the hour. Have a great day and uh, do stay tuned to Arirang TV if you can. Goodbye.